Good morning, Crossroads Church. Uh, we are deep into the Psalm series, and we're going to be looking at Psalm 51 this morning. And I'm really excited to have uh, a dear brother and father in the faith, uh, Greg Sprout, uh, preaching this morning. And I just want to do a quick intro of him. You know, we've spent a lot of time together. A lot of coffee has been drank, and we have talked a lot about theology. And what I've learned about Greg is that he is a student of the Word. And it just really is a, a, a joy to sharpen one another and to get deep into the word. And uh, so with all confidence, um, we have asked, I, I have asked and, and we have asked him to lead us this morning in the word of God teaching it. So thank you so much. And I'm going to pray for you before we jump in. Uh, Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for the gifts in your church. I thank you that there are, um, even in this little congregation called Crossroads, there are so many people that are gifted to teach. And um, Lord, I pray that you'll be with Greg, that it will be all of you and none of him, that your spirit will work through him. I'm thank you, I'm, uh, we thank you for all of the effort and planning and studying his, he's done. But even at that, Lord, we know that you will speak um, we expect you to speak through him however you want, Lord. So um, I'm excited to hear the word from him. And ultimately, Lord, you are our teacher. And so we're hearing it from your word. And, um, and you're, you're the one that changes our hearts and transforms our minds. So thank you, Lord Jesus, in advance uh, for this word this morning. And in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning, Crossroads. I'm at the coffee table, just like Justin. So at any rate, uh, we are in Psalm 51. You can open to that. I'm not going to get to it right away, uh, but you can be prepared for when I do. So sin, it, its basic meaning just means a separation from God. Now, it's kind of odd that we sometimes think that some sins are worse than other sins. And where does that all come from? Well, in the Ten Commandments, there were some sins that got more severely punished than other sins. So we have a tendency to think like that. And in our society, uh, stealing is thought maybe a little bit less than uh, committing murder. Um, but both are a sin. So you could actually have a sin of chewing bubble gum. As crazy as that sounds, you could be enslaved to chewing bubble gum. You could be enslaved to committing murder. We call them serial killers. So. Both of these are equal in God's eyes. But if we all believe that murder is an acceptable thing in society, society breaks down really fast. If uh, we have the sin of chewing bubble gum, you might suffer tooth decay, but society's not going to just fall apart. So I want to also further highlight this whole sin issue with Jesus. When he you know, discussed that the uh, Mount, of Olivet, or Mount of Olives gets through the Beatitudes and he's moving forward, and he says that if you say to your brother, Raka, you have committed murder. And if I wanted to bring Raka up to date to, well, my time period, and some of you are younger, you may not be aware of this, but Raka in my time period would mean if I called you an airhead, that would be Raka, and I just murdered you. It happens in my heart. If you look at a person with lust, you have committed adultery. So Jesus took the law and he pointed out where the problem sits. It sits in our heart. So in this audience, probably none of you have ever been to jail for murder, but you probably all committed murder. <laughs> so this psalm, as uh, when Kurt gave the introduction to the whole series a while back, there are some psalms that have a backstory. Psalm 51 has a backstory, and I don't feel like you can get the most out of Psalm 51 unless you get the backstory. And it is a gut wrenching tragedy. I mean, as we move through this, there's going to be times that you're just going to sit there and you're going to feel some pain and discomfort. Now, this story, the back story, if you will, comes out of 2 Samuel chapter 11, and it goes through chapter 12, 24. Don't rush through your Bibles to get there, because I'm not going to go verse by verse. I'm simply going to give you the highlights. 
That's all you need to really enjoy Psalm 51. And trust me, when we get to Psalm 51, you will enjoy it. Now, I do have to say that any of the language I'm about to use or words I'm using, they're all found in the scriptures. I'm not using anything different. However, the story and some of the things that we're going to talk about might be heavy for young people. So parents, I want you to be aware of that. You may have to do some explanations later, but just be there. So you can read 2 Samuel 11 through 12, 24 at your leisure sometime. But it starts out, it says, In the springtime, when kings go out to battle, David stayed in Jerusalem. That, I don't think, is just an odd thing to, to throw in there. I think it's pointing out that King David was someplace that he was not supposed to be. He was supposed to be out on the battlefield. Have you ever been someplace that you're not supposed to be when you're supposed to be someplace else? Opportunity knocks and the devil is there. And that's exactly what happens in our story. Because it's in the evening... David has been in bed, he's asleep, and he gets out of bed because he wakes up and he's like, I'm going to go for a walk. So he goes up on top of the uh, roof of the king's house. Now you've got to picture the king's house is probably a little bit bigger than any other house in Jerusalem. So he's pretty high up. And he looks out off of his roof in the middle of the night sometime, we don't know exactly when, and he sees Bathsheba. He covets Bathsheba, and he lusts after Bathsheba. So, in the morning, and I got to say, Bathsheba's taking, a, she's bathing. She's on her rooftop. And in her time period, she was probably practicing the best kind of modesty that she could possibly do. So, it wasn't like she was doing something that was wrong. It's just David happened to be in a position to uh, be able to see that. In the morning... David said to one of his servants, I want you to go out and I want you to find out things about this woman. I, I want to know about her. So the servant comes out, comes back, and he says, well, Bathsheba is married to a guy by the name of Uriah. Uriah is underneath Joab's command out on the battlefield and has been there since we sent them off to war. So David moves on to the next thing. He sends for her. Hey, have her come to the king's palace. Now, if somebody comes to you, uh, you, and says, you know, you got to go to the king's palace, you don't really have an opportunity to kind of question that, and you don't have a lot of options. I remember times when, uh, when I was in the military that I was said, go and report to Captain Rotolo. I can't ask him, and he probably doesn't even know why I have to go there. A few things I did, though, before I went, made sure my boots were polished, made sure my uniform looked right, made sure I was ready to present myself, because I have no idea what's going to happen. So, Bathsheba goes, and uh, David commits adultery with her, and she goes home. Now, she became pregnant, and Uriah, of course, is at war, so we clearly know where this child's coming from. Now, I've got to point out here, even you've got to remember, servants have gone. We've brought Bathsheba. Bathsheba spent the night. There are other people in the king's house. They all are pretty much aware something's going on. They may not have all the details, but trust me, gossip is happening. So, David has to figure out, now that he's aware that she's pregnant, there are a couple issues at hand. One... Bathsheba can be stoned to death because she's committed adultery. His reputation, though he's already damaged it by just taking the actions he had, his reputation could be damaged further. So he has to deal with this problem. So what he does is he sends word to uh, Joab, I'd like Uriah to come back here, report to me, and let me know how things are going on the battlefield. So I'm kind of guessing, because I've been in the military, if I'm being ordered to go and report to somebody like a king, I'm not dilly-dallying on the way. I'm moving as fast as I can to get word to him. So Uriah gets there and shares his report. David's 
Great, got the report. Look, Uriah, you've been out on the battlefield, you're tired, you're weary. I want you to go home, get rested, get something to eat, get ready. And he gives a present to Uriah and sends him off. Uriah is an honorable man. He did not go home. Instead, he lay down at the door of the king's house and he slept there. So the plan to have Uriah go home and then the child would naturally be Uriah's didn't happen. So in the morning, a servant comes and tells David, hey, he slept at, the house, at our house door. He did not go home. So David wants to know what's up with that. So Uriah comes in and uh, he says, well, why, why didn't you go home? Uriah, being the honorable man that he is, he says, well, the Ark of the Covenant and Judah are in temporary shelters and your servants are sleeping in the field. How can I take pleasure knowing that my brethren are out on the battlefield in those conditions? Wow, that is an incredible testimony. So, David decides to take the plan a little bit further. He says, well, why don't you sit down, have dinner with me, and, uh, you know, we're going to drink some wine. He got Uriah drunk. The idea being now that Uriah is drunk, he's not thinking as clearly. He's not th thinking about his, his uh, honorable world. He's going to think about going home and get a little comfort. Didn't work. This honorable man slept at the king's door a second night. So, David gets word in the morning that Uriah slept at the door again. We move into the next plan. David gets out a piece of paper and he writes on there instructions to Joab. The contents of the note roughly are saying, look, Joab, what I want you to do is I want you to put Uriah on the very, where the fighting is the fiercest. And when it's really incredibly hard, I want you to withdraw all the men from around him. So the note gets closed up, sealed, the stamp goes on it. Now Uriah is carrying his own death warrant. That's really what he's doing. And he doesn't even know it. And you want to know what's even worse about this? I can tell you, Uriah did not dilly-dally. He ran as fast as he could to get to Joab to deliver his death warrant. That's the kind of man Uriah was. So, <clears throat> a honorable, good man dies to cover up sin. Really? It's not completely covered up. Bathsheba was placed in a life-threatening situation. She did nothing wrong. David's the one who's done the things that are wrong. So Uriah has died. Bathsheba goes into mourning for the appropriate time period. And then David takes her as his wife. Bathsheba's life is spared because now she can't be accused of adultery. And David has what he wanted. Sin was not covered up. God saw it. And it says at the end of chapter 11, but the thing David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. I don't care where you are. I don't care what sin you're doing. If you think it's hidden, it is not. God sees it all. And he sees the sin that is in your heart. So the Lord is not going to sit quiet on this. So he sends Nathan the prophet, and Nathan shows up, and he basically tells him a parable. And roughly what that parable says is, there's this rich guy who has a lot of herds, a big piece of land, and uh, he's very wealthy. But he spies over at his, one of the poor neighbors of his, a sheep that he really likes. And he goes and takes that sheep for his own. David without being prompted. He says, tell me who that man is. I want to know who he is because I'm putting him to death right now. He's judged himself. Nathan said, it is you 
King David. So now Nathan lays it out a little bit more clear. And he embellishes on how the Lord has seen things. And there's going to be consequences. Consequence number one, the sword will never depart from your house. That means that there are going to be brothers and sisters killing each other in his own house. And we're going to raise up somebody evil in your own household. Your wives, before your very eyes, a companion will take and do in broad daylight for everyone to see what you did in secret. At this point, David's got a good part of the message, and he's, he's repenting. I mean, he's now sad for what he's done. He's starting to see it. There's one more thing. The baby is going to die. Another completely innocent person had no, nothing to do with nothing. A baby is going to die because of what you did, David. David does what I think a lot of us would do. He went into his chambers and he began praying. He was fasting. Now, clearly, this baby did not die quickly. And the point I got to make to you, God could have had that baby stillborn. God could have just reached down and stopped his heart. No pain, no illness, no nothing. He didn't. He allowed that baby to suffer. David is sitting in there praying and fasting. He's not eating. He's not drinking. He's calling out to the Lord. The servants are worried about this. They're seeing how he's taking, how badly the child's sick, and the way he's reacting. The servants get word, the baby's dead. And they start mumbling amongst each other. I, I can't go in and tell him. I mean, you see how he is right now. If he's this way now, what's he going to be like when he finds out the child is dead? It'll destroy him. David kind of hears the mumbling, and he says to him, the baby's dead. Yep. David gets up, says, get me some food, some water. I'm going to get cleaned up, get some clothes on. And the servants kind of get inquiring about this. Why, why all of a sudden the big flip in your personality here? What's going on? And this is what David says. While the child was still alive, I fasted and I wept, for I said, Who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. A child that did no sin, did nothing, he's completely innocent of anything, he's going to be in heaven. David says, I'm going to see him again. I'm going to go to him. David has a certainty about where he's headed in his afterlife. David comforted the child that is dead. Bathsheba mourns. We go through that time period again. And uh, David tries to comfort Bathsheba. In so doing, Solomon is born to Bathsheba. They named him Solomon. That means peace. And some things I had to think about. The innocent baby being taken and God being involved in that. That hits hard. So I'm going to step a little away from Scripture because it's not in Scripture. But it's fair to speculate. Why, God, are you taking that innocent baby? So the first thing I had to think about is who's going to be the next king? Well, Solomon's going to be the next king. He has to be the firstborn. Eh, no. Bathsheba is probably wife number seven. There's a whole host of kids born before Solomon comes along. It's not because of that. Now, another interesting thing happened when the child was born. We've named him Solomon. But the Lord took a look in and he sent word and said, I want you to change his name to Jedediah. That means friend of God. Now, this event seems to be 
taken pretty strongly by King David. The, the first two kings have been selected by a prophet who chose them. This is the first time we see it being passed on to a family member. And the only inclination is because of this name change, friend of God, that's who David wanted to have seated on the throne. That's why Solomon becomes king. Why do bad things happen to good people? Three people, Uriah, Bathsheba, a baby, all three, bad things happen to them. Why do bad things happen to people, good people? Because sin still reigns in my heart, in your heart. That's why. So what does it take to get your attention on God? What's it going to take to get you refocused on him? Does it take a gut-wrenching tragedy to get you refocused on why he created you and what he has planned for you? Now that brings us to Psalm 51. Because we're going to find out what David has to say. And I don't think there was probably very much time passed before he penned this psalm. I think he probably sat down pretty much afterwards and wrote this psalm. And this psalm is utterly beautiful. Verse 1, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassions, blot out my transgressions. He's really saying, have pity on me, Lord. Love is when we meet the basic necessity of somebody. They need something, and we meet that need. And David wants him to do it because he has an abundant amount of compassion. So meet my need and wipe out the breach of trust which I have committed to you. When we sin, that becomes a breach of trust to God. Remember, I've already told you, no sin is worse than another. So if you've got a problem chewing bubble gum, that's a breach of trust if that's a sin problem for you. Verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. The word wash could have been uh, uh, written as fuller. Now, fuller is when we cut a metal groove between two pieces. So we're separating metal from metal. Not an easy task to do. It also means wash. If I combine both of those two pictures to you, you got to understand that what we're saying is we want to remove bad things from other things. And this washing that David is asking for, I want you to do it thoroughly and excessively. I want you to make me polish clean. Cleanse me. Purge me. Verse 3. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. He now fully understands what he has done. And it's sitting in front of him. When we sin, it hurts us. We feel it. You're sad. Your joy is gone. And it sits in front of you. And you want that gone too. Verse 4. Against you, you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are just when you speak and blameless when you judge. When we sin against the human, we have separation from God and from the human. We have to get things right with God first. Once we fix our relationship with God, we're able to fix our relationship with humans or do the best that we can while being with humans. God had convicted him so thoroughly of his failure. Why did that child suffer for three days or more? David needed to understand fully what he had done, his failure. Five, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Uh, brought forth um, or conceived, when he was conceived in sin, he's not really saying the uh, conception was sinful. It's that what 
when he came into existence, he was in a weakened condition. He had a sin nature. Behold, verse 6, you desire truth in the innermost parts, and in the hidden part you make me know wisdom. God desires and delights in truth and faithfulness. That's what he wants to see in your soul and in your mind. Now, our mind is our place of reasoning. So we need to get our reasoning converted so that it is full of truth and faithfulness. And that happens through discipline. Wisdom is seeing things from God's point of view. If you want to be wise, you've got to deal with the discipline. You've got to recorrect that inner being, that inner person of you. Verse 7, purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. I would encourage you during your Bible reading time and study time, when you come across a plant, an animal, take the time to read about them. Just Wikipedia them. So hyssop is actually a plant that gets used for uh, medicinal reasons. They use it to deal with intestinal issues, respiratory issues, those kinds of things. It's also used to make soap. So when he says, I want to be washed with hyssop, he's really saying, I want to be clean inside and the outside. If we get our inside clean and the outside wouldn't be a problem. He's saying, I want it all cleaned. Who's doing the laundry here? David's not doing the laundry. He's saying, God, I need you to do the laundry. This is a guy, you have to remember, he's looking for a Messiah. He's looking for a Christ. And he knows that he will come and fix this problem completely. God has to do the laundry. Verse 8, make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. We're always sad after we sin. We feel that separation. Now, if there's a sheep that a shepherd has in his flock that's being disobedient, runs off in the wrong directions, and will not stay, the shepherd will actually go over and break the lamb's legs. Seriously. He then resets the legs, bandages them up, he throws the lamb over his shoulders, and during the whole healing time, he carries that lamb around, takes care of making sure he gets food and water, and heals him. You know what happens afterwards? The lamb follows the shepherd and listens to him. Verse 9, hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Do not look upon my sin, utterly make them gone. Remove my guilt, remorse of my offenses. Take this mess away from me. That's what he's yelling out for. Verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. The heart, uh, I think Kurt talked about this a while back, the heart is, for a Jew, the place of reasoning. We usually use it as our place of emotions. When we talk about our heart, I feel something. But heart for a Jew is his place of reasoning. His stomach is his place of feelings. So what he wants is his reasoning to be fixed so it's just like God's and make me right. He's looking for his Savior. He's looking for that fix. Verse 11, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Yeah, there were a few people that had the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Kings, prophets, there were others. David had the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. So if David could commit these sins, that potential rests with you too. He wants his relationship made right, and he wants to stay in a relationship with God. That's what he's after. Verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Willing could have been translated noble. He wants a noble spirit. And I have to ask the question, this comes out of uh, Jesus' comments at the uh, well where the water gets stirred up. There's a paraplegic there, absolutely helpless. 
And he walks over to him and says, do you earnestly want to be made well? I got to ask you, with your sin nature, do you earnestly want to be made well? Because that's the real question. If you want to dabble with that sin, you want to entice it, lust will add to more lust. If you want to earnestly want to get rid of it, you have the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 13, Then I will teach transgressors your way, and sinners will be converted to you. Out of the joy of the lessons that we learn, and the things that we grow in God, the forgiveness and loving compassion that he has on us, I want to go out and share that with other people because I don't want them to have to sit in misery. Verse 14, Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. Perfect justice and perfect mercy do not go together. If somebody's going to be perfectly just, that means every time somebody steps out of the line, they receive their punishment. Perfect mercy says, I will forgive all those things. Perfect justice and perfect mercy come together at the cross. That's the only way they fit together. O oh Lord, verse 15, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. Notice that we just left God. God Almighty is not here. This is now Lord. He's my king. He's the one I'm following. He is my master. And because of that, I want to boast and I want to praise what God has done. Verse 16, For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I give it. You're not pleased with burnt offerings. If you were coming to Jerusalem from a long distance off, there would be one conspicuous thing that would sit out before you even got close to town. That would be this black pillar of smoke going up. And you'd have to ask your, the question, what is that? Is there a war going on? Then you'd find out the, the story. Those are the sacrifices being offered every day for the sins that were being committed. They didn't fix anything. We're just throwing them on the, the fire, and I still have a problem. I'm not saying that they weren't supposed to do those things. They were. The law dictated that they should. But that's not what God delights in. He doesn't delight in you offering up a sacrifice. He wants a relationship, and he wants you to be like him. I have to ask the hard question. How do you use Jesus? Is he just a sacrifice to cover up my sins? Or are you using Jesus to move forward in your life? Verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not be displeased. Will you break the place of reasoning? All those false things that you have that are leading your life, are you willing to put those on the fire and burn them up and replace them with godly things? That's what you must sacrifice. God will not be displeased with those. Verse 18, by your favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. The mountain around uh, the temple is Zion. Jerusalem is the place of peace. I want a testimony of peace demonstrated. That's what we're trying to get to. Verse 19, then you will delight in the righteous sacrifices, in burnt offering and whole burnt offerings, then young bulls will be offered on your altar. Jesus is not just a cover-up for sins, but he's a life-changing event. And that's the way we need to approach him. Now, there are three aspects to salvation. The first aspect is your justification. That means that your penalty for your sins, past, present, future, are paid for through the blood of Jesus Christ. Perfect justice, perfect mercy, and it happens there. The second aspect of your salvation is the process of sanctification. And I'd like to think that we're all on an uphill pathway. More than likely, you've got some lines going like this where you fall back and you make mistakes, but you're climbing upward. It's a steady move. The third aspect of your salvation 
is glorification. Because whatever you accomplish in this life during that sacrifice or during your uh, sanctification, God gets the glory for that. It's not you doing it. It's him doing it in you. So at this point, I've got to uh, make a challenge. I, I can't let you all walk away. First, if you haven't made Jesus the king of your life, if you haven't made him your Lord and Savior, this very moment, today is that day. Don't wait any longer. Do it now. This is the perfect moment. If you're in the process of sanctification and you've got some sins that you haven't dealt with, man, this is the time to do it. Decide now. I want to earnestly be made well. I want to earnestly have this fixed. So I'm going to give you a few moments wherever you are in the crossroads world and across the internet. Take the time to accept Jesus and deal with your sin problems.